So, good morning, everybody. My name is Linda Sussman, and I'm from USAID in the Division of Research in the Population Productive Health Office at USAID, which is the office that supported this research. And so, I welcome you all this morning and appreciate all of those of you who are on Zoom or on the phone, and those of you who are in the room and were able to get here so early and to figure out where to come. So um, I wanted to also say that I'm very honored to be able to open up this discussion, this presentation. Um, for Kate Lane is the person in our office who initiated this work. She's our senior technical lead on youth. She wasn't able to be here today. And I also wanted to thank a number of people who helped get this started. There's about 150 people who have signed up either here or on the phone or on Zoom. So that's a lot of people, it's a lot of juggling, and it's also going to be recorded. And so I wanted to thank many of you who have your emails from, and Sammy Hill, and Lizzie Menstow, who have also been working on this and been helping to get this going. Um, as you know, the, or probably from just reading about it so far, the Development Asset Profile Survey is a survey that SEARCH has done in many countries, and this was an opportunity, this research, to be able to look to see how and whether development assets, as measured by the DAF, the Development Assets Profile, which SEARCH has initiated, how it is or is not related to sexual reproductive health among adolescents. And so that's the question that this research set out. <coughs> is it different for boys and girls? And what it would be really great if you, as you're listening, could be thinking about, because many of you are from very different kinds of organizations and implementing organizations as well as research. How is this relevant to your work? So can knowing that development assets among adolescents are related to sexual reproductive health, can that help you in your measurement or in your research? Can it help you figure out whether or not or how you might have develop interventions in addition to your sexual reproductive health knowledge and information that focuses on assets development. So it would be good we'll have time at the end to have questions and answers. And so if you can be thinking about that. And folks on the phone, if you can submit any questions that you have via chat, we'll be monitoring that throughout, but we'll have time at the end to talk about that. So I'd like to now introduce Kim Ashburn. Kim has been doing work on research and evaluation for over 10 years, she's been working in domestic as well as international settings. Her work spans Caribbean, Southern, and Eastern Africa, Asia, and she's been working on a lot of research, especially lately on the gender issues related to family planning and reproductive health, and especially among adolescents. So you might have heard her recently present on the Real Fathers Initiative which is looking at working with young fathers in northern Uganda to decrease intimate partner violence and to decrease harsh punishment of children. Um, the GRADE project with which this activity has been conducted with IRH is working with very young adolescents in northern Uganda as well as older adolescents, new parents, newly married. Um, a lot of this information about these other projects are also available on the IRH website. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in this kind of work, to kind of peruse through their website, look at projects such as the GREAT project, the TJ project in Benin, which works on social networks, social network influence for family planning and reproductive health, the Real Fathers Initiative, and now also a new project called Passages, which is going to be focusing on normative change among adolescents at scale. So turning it over to Kim, again welcome. If you could make sure that you sign the sign-in sheet, if one is over there and we'll pass the other one around. Thank you. And I think we'll save questions, unless they're clarifying questions, we'll save them to the very end. Thanks Linda. So as Linda said, my name is Kim and I'm working with IRH, the Institute for Reproductive Health at Georgetown University. And I'll be talking this morning about developmental assets and very young adolescents. Um, we, as, as Linda was saying, we are, are increasingly recognizing how uh, uh, developmental assets can help us 
achieve improved sexual and reproductive health for, for adolescents, especially when we started at a young age and, and working on that. Um, but we don't have a lot of evidence that provides um, support for that, looking at that relationship between sexual and reproductive health and developmental assets. So the point of this, this um, presentation this morning is to share a little bit of results that we, we have from a survey that we did in northern Uganda, looking at this very issue. So just checking while you're moving forward, can people on the phone or with Zoom, is anybody having any problems? If you're having a problem, chat or mention them now while Kim is moving to get the presentation <laughs> up and running. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulty. Oh, thank you. Oh, gosh. Am I obstructing? No, you're great, Kim. Go ahead. Okay. So, so we, we conducted the survey. Um, USAID has been interested in um, uh, positive youth development, and they were have been very interested in the developmental assets profile that was developed by Search Institute. So they asked us, could we collaborate with Search to um, do a survey to actually answer this question, um, are sexual and reproductive health outcomes related at all or linked at all to developmental assets? So IRH, um, about a year ago, well, actually longer than that now, two years ago, um, started working with Search Institute. And my collaborators, I didn't put them up here, but um, they were Peter Scales and Mara Shramko from Search Institute. Um, we developed this, uh, well, we used the DAP, anyway, I'll get to that. <laughs> we um, conducted this survey in northern Uganda in the Gulu area among um, 10 to 14 year old boys and girls in uh, public schools, in primary and secondary schools in, um, in that area. So there were a couple sort of key rationale for conducting this study other than the, the great interest in um, positive youth development. We, we know globally among all adolescents, about half of them are of the very young adolescent age group, the 10 to 14 year old age group. Um, we, we are, as I said, having this growing recognition of, of adolescent positive, um, positive youth development and, and trying to identify those factors that really influence um, improved sexual and reproductive health and well-being of, of children and ensure healthy development. Um, we also know that there's, there's less research um, targeting this younger age group, the 10 to 14 year olds. Um, and we also know that girls in particular have more um, have, have fewer assets and therefore are more susceptible to poor health outcomes, HIV infection, um, um, violence victimization, um, having the capacity to negotiate their sexuality. Um, and we also identified fewer studies that really focus on these, in, these sort of individual level assets and social assets. So we were very interested to see what happens when we um, try to measure these and link them to developmental assets. So when we say developmental assets, this is um, actually the Search Institute uh, definition. Um, <clears throat> they are critical supports, the external, and strengths the internal that young people need to grow up healthy, caring, and productive. Just to sort of simplify that, um, we, what we're talking about really are those key factors that influence health and well-being um, for young people. So now on to uh, one of the ways that we measure developmental assets and what has been developed by Search Institute is something called the developmental assets profile. The developmental assets profile is a quantitative survey instrument. <clears throat> it's been used globally in the US as well as across regions in Africa, Asia, South America. Um, <clears throat> it includes eight, um, eight asset categories. And these you can see on the left side of the slide. And some of the four of those asset categories are considered to be external supports. And these are the resources that a youth, a young person might have in the context in where they live to support their development. And then there are things that are called internal strengths, which are really at the individual level, their beliefs, their attitudes, their behaviors that influence their uh, health outcomes and well-being. And each one of these uh, categories, or, or what they call um, asset categories, can be sort of rearranged in the survey to um, be related to a particular asset building context which is the column on the right-hand side of the slide. And there are five different 
uh, contexts that they have developed. So that includes personal, social, family, school, and community. So together, all of this is sort of the framework um, that search has used to comprehensively measure developmental assets for adolescents. Originally, I just wanted to note, originally the, the, the developmental assets profile, or the DAP as we call it, was developed for 11 to 18 year olds. So um, I, I think it's kind of important just to note, note kind of that part of it. Um, and we're focusing on the 10 to 14, so kind of in the lower half of that um, age group. So uh, this, this slide shows a sample of some of the items from the developmental assets profile. Um, and the corresponding asset scale that each each one of these individual items came from, and then the related context assets. <laughs> so, not to be too confusing, bless you. <laughs> so the first one, just for an example, um, the first item reads, I seek advice from my parents, and that is related to the support asset scale, which is then <laughs> rearranged into the context scale of family, or related to the family context scale. And each one of the items, the DAP is made up of 58 items. So each one of these statements or lines that you see on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, there are 58 of these. And each one corresponds to a different asset scale and a different context scale. They, the response categories, they used a four-point Likert scale. So that means a person could respond across a range of, um, of um, agreement from not at all or um, to um, always or extremely depending on the phrasing of the item. Um, and I'm just showing a few more examples of items that are related to these different asset scales. Um, you can see some have, um, they're, I was, anyway. Um, so, so some of the ones that I think are interesting, the social competency um, asset scale, for example, I build friendships with other people. I think it's important to help other people I resolve conflicts without anyone getting hurt. So, um, because our study was supposed to be looking at sexual and reproductive health, we uh, sat down and, and looked at some of the ways that we've measured at IRH sexual and reproductive health among very young adolescents in the past, and we generated um, a, um, a, um, a new sort of section of the, for the survey that covers sexual and reproductive health indicators like these. We included a range of knowledge, attitudes, um, and some intentions. Um, we were looking specifically at how, how capable people thought of accessing sexual and reproductive health services, supportive relationships, meaning they had someone to talk to, a trusted adult to talk to about the, um, how to take care of themselves while, during menstruation for girls and for boys once they started ejaculation, how to manage that that they had a trusted adult to talk to about the, these changes that their body was going through and in their emotions during puberty, um, those, those kinds of questions. Um, we, the one at the bottom, intention to delay sex or use condoms, we originally really wanted to explore sexual behavior and sexual activity among this, this age group. But in Northern Uganda, um, <laughs> some of you may know, <laughs> sexual debut for girls is around 16 or so, and for boys, a little bit older. So there, when we t first pre-tested our uh, measures, the only, I, out of 128 kids, I think we had two or three that said that they were sexually active. So we had to kind of go back and say, right, okay, if what would be a better proxy for sexual activity and, and um, what would be meaningful in terms of measuring that behavior? So we went to intention. So intention to delay um, sex before marriage and intention to um, use a condom if they couldn't delay sex before they, they were uh, married. So those are the eight sort of key, um, key measures for sexual and reproductive health that we used. And just to say, I, I just want to add, for each one of these, we similarly had several items that, that each one of these were composed of several items or statements. And the response categories were usually yes or no, or true or false if it was a knowledge question. So it, we took a, a, a bit of a process for adapting the DAP, which involved several steps. First, the DAP was written in English and translated into the local language Acholi, um, Luo, and then back translated into English for, to, to ensure that the, the way that the 
question was stated was had the same meaning um, when it was translated. Um, and then we did a series of focus groups with adults and kids. Um, some of them were teachers, some of them were parents, some of them were community members. To it was primarily to check the translation that the way that we intended the statements was the way that people were understanding them. Um, and so that whatever came out of the focus group fed back to this, this process of translating the, the, the deaf instrument. And whoops, oh my goodness, that's sensitive, sorry. <laughs> and then we did a, a pretest with 128 boys and girls who were of the same age and, and very similar. We just went to another school, another two schools, and, um, and recruited some kids to test the, um, the measures and then finalized. And then we implemented it among about 900, well, we in, in, implemented about 1,000 um, girls and boys after we claimed the data, we ended up with a, a sample size of about 941 kids. So, um, and most of them, um, so all of them came from 14 primary and secondary schools in the Gulu area. Um, they were all public schools. And most of these kids, the vast majority, um, were in families and households that have some economic constraints. So most kids said that they, that in their family household, they could afford basic necessities, but nothing else. And about 36% said that they, their family um, couldn't always afford basic necessities. Just to give you a, a little bit of an idea of the context and, um, and, and the setting. Um, but before I get into reporting out some of the results of the measures and the scales and, and the relationships, <laughs> Um, I just wanted to touch on the validity and the reliability of the measures that we were using. Um, so we, we, we did what's called the Cronbeck um, Alpha to test the reliability of the scale. Um, and, and for most of the, the subscales in, in the instrument, they, they were performing at an acceptable level um, or a promising level. <laughs> um, there were... Um, significant correlations that we saw in the data between sexual and reproductive health and developmental assets, which really supported that our hypothesis was supported, so it really helped to support the validity of this, yeah, this instrument overall. We did have um, two asset categories that didn't work very well. One was empowerment, and the other one was constructive use of time. So for whatever reason, given that context, those things just didn't seem to resonate with people in a very, they weren't really measuring some underlying construct in the way that we had thought they would. So the DAP scoring, I said there were 58 items in the DAP. Um, uh, there's a total possible score of 60. And um, though the, the overall score in the DAP is, um, the, depending on what score they had, people can be classified or respondents can be classified at different levels. So those kids at the bottom you see thriving, they had 52 to 60 points. <laughs> and so they were at the top, they had the highest levels of developmental assets. And then the adequate and vulnerable and so on and down to the, the um, challenged level, which means they had the fewest, um, the lowest level of developmental assets. So we use these categories in our analysis. 61% of the girls and the boys together were either in the thriving category or the adequate category. About a third of them were um, vulnerable according to our scaling process, and only 7% were in the challenge category. This slide shows sexual and reproductive health outcomes, and here we're comparing girls versus boys. The girls are light blue and the boys are dark blue. Um, you can see that overall the girls have uh, higher levels of knowledge, they have more um, gender equitable attitudes, they have greater ability to access sexual and reproductive health services, um, a higher proportion of girls than boys have an intention to delay um, marriage before or sex before marriage. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I also thought what was really interesting here is that for um, ha those, those kids who reported more supportive relationships, about a quarter of the girls did and only 12% of the boys did. And this is a theme that you'll see later in, um, in other results that I'll show you. Kind of just gives you a sense of, 
of what's going on. In, in addition to those composite measures for sexual and reproductive health, we also included a few discrete measures. So these were just one-off, have you heard of HIV? Have you heard of condoms? I, we didn't exactly ask it exactly like that, but we, we asked if they had heard of these things, um, if they've ever seen a condom. And then we, we kind of, we wanted to um, get at, um, we included some measures on teasing and bullying because we, we didn't really ask about violence outright, but we thought that these would be good um, for this age group to get some sense of what the experience is um, in terms of gender relationships between boys and girls. Um, maybe, I don't know if you can really consider it a precursor to violence, but definitely how they treat each other at this age. So um, we asked boys and girls if teasing girls is an appropriate way for boys to show that girls that they like them, and only 17% agreed with that statement. Um, we also asked if, asked if girls should be flattered when boys acted like that. You can see at the top of the, the on the right hand side, only 10% of the boys and girls agreed with that statement. And interestingly, when we asked boys, have you ever touched girls on the breast or buttocks without their permission, 4% said that they had. And when we asked girls, had you ever been touched on, when you didn't want or didn't provide your permission, 4% said that they had to completely matched, which was I thought was amazing and kind of interesting. Um, we also asked if um, boys would um, be made fun of by other boys if they didn't tease girls. 40% agreed with that. And 86% of girls said that they felt that they could tell a boy to stop doing something if that it makes them, or yeah, tell boys to stop doing something that makes them feel uncomfortable. So we, don't, we didn't really use these um, in the rest of the analyses, but I just wanted to show them to you. Um, so what we, we ended up using odds ratios. We, we looked at, at correlations, of course, but I don't have any of those to share with you today. We thought that the odds ratios would be kind of an easy way to understand the data. Um, so we compared kids who were at the thriving and the adequate levels, the two highest levels of, of developmental assets. We compared them to the kids at the two lower levels. And we found um, across various measures that the kids with the higher levels of de developmental assets were signif had significantly greater odds of having more accurate HIV knowledge, more um, capacity or access to SRH services, and um, we had um, more intention or, or greater odds of intending to delay sex before marriage or to use condoms at first sex. And this, is, this combines girls and boys together. And then we said, okay, that's the, the top two levels. What happens when you look at the very top level and you compare them to all the other youth, so all the other kids at any other level? And again, we see a very strong um, uh, association between high levels of developmental assets and reproductive health outcomes. So we, here we're looking at accurate condom knowledge and HIV knowledge, and um, both, for both of those, the kids at the higher levels had also um, uh, high, higher levels of knowledge in these areas. Uh, for girls, we, we looked at those girls that were at the thriving level, and they, were, they had 78% greater odds than girls at other levels of reporting that they had supportive um, relationships um, in terms of sexual and reproductive health. And for boys, they were twice as likely to. So the guys at the very top of the, um, the very highest developmental asset scores were twice as likely as any other boy to report having a supportive relationship. Um, so this, this is really all the actual data that I had to share. Um, but I think we have some really important findings that provide lots of great evidence that, that this is an important area to work on um, in conjunction with the other ongoing youth programming that we're doing. So um, how do we implement those programs <laughs> to build the assets, these important assets, um, to help kids to, to successfully navigate puberty and to ensure that, that uh, positive health and development? And uh, some of those ways that we identified were working with parents to um, help them to be able to support their children through puberty, um, expanding, we're saying rights-based programming on, with the understanding that uh, access to healthcare and uh, healthy development and, and a safe environment to grow up in are all, part, are all 
um, enshrined as human rights, um, and it, helping kids to engage in their communities um, actively um, to be in whether a service or action um, would encourage uh, the, the development of these types of, of um, support these types of assets. Um, developing the skills of young kids, whether that's life skills, communication skills, social skills, will also support ensuring um, healthy development and successful passage through puberty to um, older adolescents. And we're also thought that this would help in assuring um, links with community schools, parents, for all of them to be involved in, in supporting kids um, and, and encouraging these um, kinds of uh, programming that focuses on developmental assets. We did have two implications for research, one being this was a cross-sectional study, so we obviously couldn't establish a cause-effect relationship, um, so we'd have to do that in another study that would kind of track kids over time. We also spent some time reflecting on and trying to refine and test sexual and reproductive health indicators, and we think that contributes something to the field, particularly for these kids um, of this age group and that we can continue to do that sort of work. Um, and this could contribute to other, um, other research that's going on that we know of, like the early adolescent, the global early adolescent study, um, as we try to link sexual and reproductive health outcomes with developmental assets, really teaches us some important things about that, um, that those higher kids with more developmental assets or greater developmental assets are also those kids with healthier behaviors, better knowledge, more access to sexual and reproductive health care services. So um, looking at youth programming in a more holistic perspective will probably lead to improved um, health status and well-being for young people. Um, so just to finally wrap it up, we uh, published a paper in like, January, I think it was, or February of this year. This is an abstract. You can find it on the IRH link, uh, a link to this on the IRH website if you're interested in reading more. Um, and also links to our study report, which is a little more detailed in the, in the study brief. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> And um, we've got a number of people on Zoom and on the phone. And welcome to those of you who came in afterwards before they received the original welcome. Um, we'd really like to open it now for questions, clarifications, questions, and also reflections from you. Because we have researchers here and on the phone as well as implementers. And it would be really good for us to understand how you're thinking. If you have any questions or just want to raise issues about how can you use this kind of thing, whether it's in research or evaluation or thinking about designing and implementing an intervention. Um, again, if you haven't signed in, if you're in the room, if you could please do so. And for folks on the phone, if you could send in by chat your questions. And when you ask questions, if you could, if you're in the room, if you could just provide us with your name and the organization that you're working with. Uh, thank you, Kim, for sharing. Very interesting work. And um, I have a couple. Uh, oh, sorry, Marjorie Masieda, and I'm an independent consultant. Um, I have a question and also a comment that I can mention about how I might be able to use this work. Um, a couple of things you mentioned. I thought one was interesting, the findings that girls uh, had more information, generally knowledge, than boys, because often you hear that it's kind of the other way around. And I'm wondering, because it's a younger age set, that perhaps girls mature a little quicker than boys at that age, if that could have something to do with that, or if you have any thoughts on that. Also, I was curious about the empowerment and um, constructive use of time, how that was seen differently. Um, and I'm working right now on a project with Save the Children. We're trying to do a counseling, um, uh, materials to use in the counseling session. And one thing they're looking at is risk and protective factors, mm -hmm. how that would uh, figure in, in the general assessment of the youth, coming up with a scale to kind of help um, mm -hmm. direct the counseling and what should weigh more. So, mm -hmm. you know, that would be, I think, a practical application. Interesting. I'd like to do more, maybe through the website, if you have more information.
Yeah, so <laughs> thank you, Marjorie. Great questions. I, I, I thought it was interesting, too, that girls had more information. I think the boys, in, in some of those discrete measures that we saw on have you ever um, heard of condoms, have you ever seen one, that was much higher for boys than girls. But for, in terms of information, the girls had the proportions of girls that had more accurate information about HIV and puberty, purely puberty, they seem to know, and, and, and probably given, you know, the girls, some of the girls, not very many had, I mean, maybe a quarter of them that we surveyed had actually started their um, menstruation. But, the, but that may have, uh, you know, bumped those numbers up a little bit and, and so that they're a little bit more aware of, of reproductive health than boys at this stage. Um, and um, there's something about the age group, I think, um, because they are younger, so, I, and, and they're still in school, which is really important in terms of how, you know, I think these might be a little, look a little differently for kids who are not in school, which is one of the limitations that we had, but for, you know, sort of practical purposes, we just went to the school because it was much easier to find the kids and, you know, you're having a timeline and all these sorts of things. It would be very interesting to do this with out of school kids and see how, how that works. Um, the, the concept of empowerment, the way that it was measured in the DAP was, had a lot of items I think there were three or four items that measured empowerment, and several of them focused on safety and security in, in the environment, which we know from other research in northern Uganda that is there's a lot of violence, and a lot of kids don't necessarily feel particularly safe in their environment. Um, and, and so I'm not sure if that had something to do with it, um, the way that it performed in this in this particular context. The um, that, um, what was the other one, time, time, use of time, constructive use of time. I understand from Search Institute um, doesn't necessarily function or perform very well in other contexts as well. So there may just be something inherent in how that was put together, maybe it was tested um, more in, in maybe the US-based context than, than globally. So maybe it's not quite, doesn't quite seem relevant for every context. Because your time is an asset, and maybe time is more too. Right, right, yeah. How you spend your time is a little different. We're so structured in a more Western culture than I think other places. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to, to pick up on just what you were saying. Well, one thing that was very, really, I'm, I'm honestly from Handicap International, so I work on, on disability related issues. Um, and, and throughout, as you were presenting, I, I was just thinking in the back of my mind, what about? Children with disability, and, yeah. and I'm wondering if you disaggregate the data by either disability, by poverty um, level, by yeah. even age group. Was there a difference yeah. between ten year olds versus eleven? Yeah. That's, that's although we're talking about a group, the difference between probably knowledge of a fourteen year old and a ten year old. Do you, right. you disaggregate by those sort of groups? And, and I think particularly with some in school and out, out of school, yeah. this was quite interesting. So I guess my question is. Did you come across children with disabilities? Um, and, and if they had intellectual or hearing difficulties, how did you do the survey with them? Um, uh, and the sort of second piece, I guess, comes to the data that you found. How does that compare to maybe US children aged between 10 and 14? You know, again, do, do, do girls in the US have a greater level of knowledge? Are they, are they outcome from this are expecting, or is that a new uh -huh. thing can, could you repeat the question because we're here? Oh yeah, sure. So, so um, the questions were: Did did we um, identify any um, disabled children, anyone with an intellectual or hearing um, um, disability, and how did we manage that? Um, did we look at our results uh, across the different age groups, and um, what what how did, did these results compare to results that are from the United States? For a similar age group of kids, and unfortunately, I am going to be really bad at answering all these questions. We didn't, that I know, come across children with disabilities, uh, which I'm sure they were there in the schools. But I, um, but I wasn't in the field when they were collecting the data, and they never reported anything about a child with a disability. So, if there's anyone with a hearing problem or with any, you know, intellectual problem, I, I, d I don't, I don't think that they were in the survey. Um, well, yes. Yeah. 
Right. I don't know if that was our case. I have to think back to the IRB. Let me just address the other, the age disaggregation we haven't done, um, but um, mainly because I think we sort of, you, you know, in a lot of research, 10 to 14 year olds are lumped together. I'm not saying that's a great way to do it, but <laughs> that is that is how um, a lot of uh, study results and programs are evaluated and so forth. So I think it would be interesting to see, you know, are the 10 year olds quite different from the 14 year olds? I'm assuming that there would be many differences. Um, so. We we haven't we haven't done that but but um, but we we should and we could um, and how this compares to the, to the U.S. I'm not I'm not very sure I think it's very similar I couldn't tell you exact numbers but I think it is it has has very similar look to what um, what kids maybe slightly more positive so I do um, we did have a discussion about that. That only seven percent of these kids were in, um, at that sort of challenge level, and we were expecting that to be a little bit higher. Um, but but you know, people you know reflect positively on their lives sometimes in ways that maybe you know not exactly you know reflecting the, what another person might interpret their reality to be like. Yeah. I have there's a couple of questions that are related that came in from the Zoom or from the phone. And they're about the relationship with between DAP variables and the SRH outcomes. So one of them is asking if you analyze, a, if you found a differential effect from the external versus the internal assets separately. So what happens with the external assets and versus the internal assets mm -hmm. as they're related to reproductive health. And then the other one, Related to that is, are some of the developmental assets that you looked at more predictive of better SRH outcomes than others? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, sure. So, so some are more predictive. Like we saw that with the odds ratios. Like some have like a uh, the magnitude is much higher. So the odds, the odds ratio itself is is a lot higher. And so you know some of those interesting ones. Or the ones that keep jumping out in my head are the the ones for the boys in terms of their supportive relationships. So so having that being at that thriving level of developmental assets, it's so important for them in terms of having those supportive relationships. Um, so so yes, definitely some are more are stronger predictors than others. Um, I and I I don't know other than what I presented earlier. Let me go back maybe. Oh, oh. Um, to to kind of just look at that, but um, in terms of the external assets versus the internal assets, um, I don't I don't have that breakdown um, here with me, and I'm trying to think of the sort of correlations and stuff that we that we saw. I c I can say that when we looked at correlations between the asset categories, so those internal and external assets that kids have. Um, and we measured those against the um, sexual and reproductive health outcomes. There were, of the, all those various possibilities of relationships, there were 38 correlations that were significant. So, um, and, and a majority of them were significant for girls only. So 16 of those 38 relationships were just for girls and eight of those relationships were just for boys, <laughs> which I think is pretty interesting in terms of thinking about like what's important to focus on to um, the vulnerabilities of girls and, and their reproductive, sexual and reproductive health outcomes versus for boys. So these are important for boys and girls, but they seem to be particularly important for girls. Um, what was the other thing I wanted to say? I think 14 of those relationships were were significant for girls and boys both. Yeah. 
Yes. I think. Wait, is, this, is it related to what? No, it's just, I don't know. It's all good. My name is Leah Meadows. I work with Population Services International. And I was wondering if boys and girls got the same survey. So did you ask boys if someone could touch them when they didn't want to? And did you realize yes, that? Yes, great question. Um, if you could report that on that. Yeah, we, we did ask everyone. We, we asked everyone mostly the same questions, except for that. <laughs> and so we we actually we thought about it, and and um, I, we we only we ended up only asking it of girls. I think our local partners were kind of like, no, this isn't going to work for boy. You know, no. First of all, they were skeptical that anyone would really that that the boys would actually say that they had touched a girl without her permission. And so they were surprised that anybody actually answered that question. And so <laughs> they were saying, of course, they're boys. Of course, they do this. So when we, sat, when we said, you know, maybe we need to open this up and, and ask the boys the same question, you know, were they touched? They, they, didn't, they didn't think that that would be such a great question. So we, we just left it out. We just asked uh, the girls those particular questions. But everyone got the same, um, everyone got the same instrument, the same questions were asked to everybody. Hey, um, so my name is Kirsten Gillette Pierce. I'm an intern at the Center for Health and Gender Equity. Um, so my, basically my questions have to do with what you're saying as well as um, just implementing something like this domestically. Um, looking at your program implementation slide and seeing how like communities of color across the board, all domestically and internationally, face some of the same issues when it comes to like gender relations and um, and women and youth and girls empowerment. Um, I was just wondering if this could be implemented here domestically. And second, what type of involvement could be done for masculine bodies here? Because it is it's necessary to involve um, masculine and feminine bodies when talking about um, empowerment and sexual and reproductive health. Okay, great. Um, and can, could you just oh, repeat that for the yes. it's okay, it's okay. So the question was uh, about um, the, the JAP survey, could it be implemented in the US? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, and, the, and the second question was, how do we deal with masculine and feminine bodies in our programming? Or how are we thinking, how are we approaching that and thinking about that? And so the, the JAP has been administered in the US before. So there, there's, um, if you go to Search Institute's website, there's lots of of reports from um, the various studies and administrations of the survey that they've done. So you can have a look there. And um, in terms of the masculine and feminine bodies, I, I think this is a, a really important question and <laughs> kind of was like what we were just talking yeah. about. <laughs> um, and why were we limiting these questions to just girls when boys um, are certainly experiencing very similar um, treatment? Um, so I think, I mean, I, 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 I see different uses for, for this kind of survey, but I would really like to hear what you guys have to say about it. I would be interested in knowing how you might take this and use it in your own programming and what 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 utility would it have in either, um, I could see it as being um, like a monitoring kind of tool, I could see it as being sort of an assessment sort of in thing, or um, certainly in, in a way to evaluate what you're doing if you're addressing any of these particular topics in a, in a program. But I, I would be curious if anybody feels bold to offer an idea about maybe they've thought about, have seen this before, have thought about it before, or have been an idea sparked after hearing these results. It would be interesting, you know, I think, to share and even before, just to add the, a similar question that came on the computer was how would you be able to use this or would you be able to use this in an in-school health information program? So that was a question that's just recently come up. Mm -hmm. Atifa, could you just um, say who you are? And also, I'm not sure, will people be able to hear on it's the other side of you? It's a little bit fuzzy, so we might just have to um, have you repeat what, what folks the on the other end of the room are saying. I'll, I'll try to talk loudly. Um, so my name is Aki Fadrachna, and I work at USAID as a global health care as a gender advisor, um, working on family planning issues and gender. And um, to answer your, well, to, to provide, my opinion about how would we sort of like use this in our work and in terms of 
what I'm saying is, in terms of the life course or the life cycle approach, it'd be really interesting, I think, to see how these factors would change over time. So if we look at 10 to 14 now, and then maybe look at 15 to 18 and see what the differences would be in these outcomes and these indicators, and better, to me, that would give us a way to better understand how to teach some of our programming. Um, if we look at what assets are more, you know, have better utility for young people as they move from one cycle to the or one part of the court life course or stage to the next. Um, so I'd really be interested in seeing what what differences might be. And um, in terms of docs that have been done in the United States, and I know you can't really compare, but have you thought about that? It, you know, maybe looking at what what has come out in the U.S. in terms of kids from 15 to 18 and seeing if there might be a way to compare or to, to look at how this could change as you move from 10 to 14 to 15 to 18. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, another question was, Tim, I know we had a question earlier about why young women and young men are so different. And I kind of want to dig into that a bit more to better understand what some of the reasons would be behind why young boys have lower outcomes than young girls. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we talked about, you know, maybe timing in terms of maturity, but I feel like there's some other, there could be some other reasons or factors that we can mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I just wanted to echo from the computer, one of the things that Afifa is talking about is the difference in assets for older adolescents versus younger adolescents. And one of the questions is, just can you clarify, was this asset profile specifically designed for 10 to 14 year olds or did the study just focus on 10 to 14 year olds and the whole issue of how the person who wrote in said and reiterated what Afifa was saying is, is how adolescents would have different assets and different cognitive abilities etc whether they're younger or older mm -hmm. yeah I, I so so that the DAP was developed originally for 11 to 18 year olds. And we did the survey among 10 to 14 year olds. Um, so I, I love the life cycle idea. I think it would be very interesting to see, you know, compare these guys down the road a bit and see what happens when they're a few years older and where are they up or down on these asset um, developmental assets are, you know, the internal ones changing in a certain way or the external ones also changing. And I'd be interested to see that um, myself. I, 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 um, we haven't thought about comparing to the U.S. necessarily, um, but, you know, we could. I, I would certainly guess that they would be different, and I think they would be very different as, as the kids across the life course for, for young kids. I think young kids living in the Ugandan Gulu town context are really different from the kids that are, in, in terms of the, the way their lives are structured and the access to resources that they have and the kind of the way that they consider their parents, <laughs> the way that they consider the elders in their community. And I think their experience has been vastly different in this particular area was um, affected hugely by this by civil war for 20 something years. So that that all has some ramifications for their lives now. And so I, I would think they would be pretty different, but but I, you know, some of these, you know, these these subscales worked, performed really well for the most part in this context. So it's interesting to see that you can take something that's developed for a slightly different age group, developed in a slightly different context, and put it down in, in this in this setting, and and it it seems to be um, effectively robustly measuring the things that we think it's measuring. <laughs> Let's just go around the table. I'll get your name. Sure thing. My name is Audrey English, and I work on adolescent growth issues and education consulting. And uh, for comment and question, too, in terms of how this would be applied in programming, in, in the reality of program design, there's so much prioritization that has to be placed. I think just looking at these specific correlations is where some of the key key correlations are, depending on the, the goal and the outcome of the program, this, this would be very useful in, 
in making some recommendations for what you can give you. Of course, want to advocate for as, as much level as possible. There are always decisions that have to be made for actions of availability. And this would be very, very useful for that. Um, a quick, a quick follow-up question to the way some of the comments earlier in was in terms of the recruitment of participants for the survey, how was this open recruitment? Did you use school touch points? Did mm -hmm. you open it to in school out of school or mm -hmm. parents um, mm -hmm. out of or not with parents? Were there any other parameters you think about with this on these populations that you answered? And one of the questions coming across was the clarification of that it was in school. Mm -hmm. but so I just wanted to repeat sure. that for the person on the phone. Right? Sure. So so the question was how how this could be well, it was more of a comment how it could be applied with your work and, and working with adolescent um, girls specifically, right? The adolescent girls well, for, me, yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. um, and and that you were seeing this as a as a really interesting tool to use for honing in on how to spend your resources and what um, what con uh, constructs to focus on programmatically. Um, and so then the other question was, how did we recruit the participants for the survey? So we identified 14 primary and secondary schools, and we looked at those grade levels that corresponded with the age of the participants that we were looking for for the survey. survey. And um, we worked with the education, the, the education officials in, in that district, and, um, and we mainly picked the schools. Um, what did we do? I'm trying to think back to our sampling strategy. I think we did, we categorized, we tried to categorize them um, by um, primary, secondary schools, and we randomly selected a number of schools in each one of those strata. And then, and then we, we went to the school that we uh, selected, and we went to the grade, those classrooms, and we basically recruited all the kids that were in that classroom. Um, and, and it was done, by uh, in conjunction with the teachers, but the teachers weren't present when we were asking the kids if they wanted to participate in the study so that they wouldn't feel pressured um, uh, or coerced in any way to participate. And they used these little um, cards to fill in yes or no, did they want to be in the study, and they put it in an envelope. It was all very confidential, so no one knew um, how a kid was responding. The teachers didn't know. So. Um, and then the, the survey itself was administered in a really fun and interactive way. So kids were like running from tree to tree and picking up cards and doing all this stuff. So it, was, it wasn't just sort of a rote, you know, the interviewer asked a question and the kid answered. It was, it was much more interactive than that and fun. And the kids really enjoyed it. We, didn't, we had less than 10% that, that didn't want to participate in the survey. They were really excited about it. And, they thought that it would be, you know, their, their friends were doing it and they wanted to be participating in it. So we had to, of course, get the parental uh, consent before we um, implemented the survey with anyone. So we had parent meetings and the study was explained and the parents provided the consent or not. And then the child could say, yeah, I want to participate or I don't. So um, anyway, it was a whole process um, that we went through. Um, was there another part of that question? Related question from the um, computer is how long did it take to actually complete the survey? Oh, with um, an individual child, uh, I think it was it was about forty five minutes, if I remember correctly, on sort of on average. So they they weren't there for a long, long time. Plus, they, they would have gotten bored by by if we had taken too much time with them. So we tried to be you know make this instrument pretty concise, make it fun. And um, not, you know, keep them around, hovering around for too long. Question, I think Hi, Elizabeth Arlotti here from Zoom to Help. Um, and I want to ask a practical question because they're thinking about how to integrate into program activities. So early on, you mentioned the duration of the study was a year long. So how did that break out in terms of the adaptation of the tool mm -hmm. versus bringing enumerators mm -hmm. versus collecting the actual data versus anything else? Yeah. And if you could talk about that. Oh, sure. We have about five minutes, but a number of questions. Okay. So to oh, okay, to speed we'll through. So, so the question is about um, practical questions about how long did it take to implement from start to finish, and about resources, approximately how much did it cost to put on in in northern Uganda. So we, um, it it was it was fairly rapid. I mean, the whole thing took a year because there's you know, getting the funding, getting the startup, and doing the faffing around that you do <laughs> before you, you know, identify the people that you are going to work with and all that. So we, it took us probably 
it didn't take us long at all. To, the longest part was gathering the information about the schools. So getting the, um, the sampling universe took some time. Um, and then getting the parent parental consent took a little bit of time because not all the parents come to the meetings. We tried to do it when they were um, at, at vacation for school. So then the first day that they come back, often the parents bring the kids back. And so then that's an opportune time to have the meeting. So that, that took a little bit of time. And implementing the survey itself among the 14 schools probably took a week or so. It wasn't like a long, long process for that, that part of it. But it was several months probably building up to that, I think. The, the adaptation process itself um, took the, the translation took about a week or so, and then do, setting up all the focus groups, another couple, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I couldn't tell you exactly um, from memory, but um, I, I think you have to, you know, think of spending six months or so doing it, maybe three months if you're all together, if you don't have to develop the indicators that we had to do, you know, if you were just to take this and plunk it down, I would say the DAP is a proprietary. So um, you you uh, would have to get their permission to use their instrument. Um, and even us, we couldn't repeat this without DAP's permission. And resources, I, I, I don't know, per person cost. Um, of doing the survey in Northern Uganda would be different for another context. So it, it probably would be more important to know about level of effort of the, how many staff are involved and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to repeat it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> sure. So Amy Uccello, I'm with the um, USAID School of Health Bureau as well and a uh, youth advisor with um, the Youth Board. And so we are working a lot on positive youth development, of which the DAP is a great example of positive youth development and cross-sectoral programming. I had a couple of questions. One, did you measure other sector results um, or was it only SRH? And if it's only SRH, was it both HIV and COP results? Um, two, I hope that you will share this with youth power learning as we are trying to build an evidence base that is more international than one that has been built domestically about multiple um, benefits from cross-sectoral positive youth development approaches. Who collected the data? Who were your, uh, were they young people themselves? And then lastly, um, how did you follow up with the young people, if at all, after the survey was conducted? Mm -hmm. Oh. My most important one, Did you were there shared inputs amongst these young people that would lead to these built assets, such as like a comprehensive sex education in the schools, their parents were at home, um, lots of NGO donor funding being in that area. Were there sort of reasons that we could, that built those assets and, and uh, protective factors that we could replicate? Mm -hmm. And then also, um, you had a there's a question over here. Was it your last? But we're going to take this as the last question, and then you can answer everything before we. Can. Sure. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. I feel like it might be a link to the Sarn Court in Paris and Global Pan Africa, and we do um, youth outreach primarily in South Africa, with um, a focus on like global empowerment and concerning intelligence. And, and we're working on changing our evaluation tool. And what we have now is the same survey, and it takes a while, and it, you know, it, it's all written. And so what you said about the findings and just interactive for the case, I would love to hear more about that. It's time and, and, yeah, sure. Because um, I think I think that's critical to getting quality data, yeah. particularly with what we're looking at, right? I mean, it's, it's hard and it's complicated, and you're not as likely to really think about it. And, and what I also wanted to think about on um, just the age distinction. I found it very interesting that 86 percent said that they would stand up for themselves if they were on percent And I'm so curious what that would look like in the 15 to 19 age group. And mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I, I really want to know. Mm -hmm. And right. in the having yeah. a supportive, like having an adult that they could talk to, I also wonder what that would look like. Today. How that changes. Uh, yeah, especially for boys. Yeah. So I think we're going to um, ask Kim to kind of try to answer as much as you can in a couple of minutes because we have to close up and then also help us understand how 
some of these, there's a lot of questions coming through and how, how these can be um, followed up. Sure, so um, so I'll try to address the questions that you asked, um, Amy, Amy, sorry, um, Amy, about um, uh, the measurement, uh, the measures we use. So we did cover a little bit on HIV knowledge, on the condom knowledge questions were about, you know, do, do, can condoms prevent a person from getting HIV? Can condoms prevent pregnancy? Um, we asked about puberty, um, about the particular changes when, you know, for boys, we gave little scenarios. So we told like a little short story and, you know, what's happening with this boy and, you know, did, did you, when this happened first to you, did you know what was happening? Did you understand? Um, and similarly for the girls. And um, we asked about pregnancy risk. Um, can a girl get pregnant um, the, um, the first time she has sex and those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. And about male fertility, you know, can a boy um, after he has his first ejaculation, um, make a someone pregnant, a woman or a girl pregnant. Um, so we we try to include all those kinds of um, measures. Um, uh, we would definitely share with our other sectors. Any any other sectors? No, no. We are strictly looking at that relationship between sexual and reproductive health and developmental assets. But it would. But I think that um, search has worked on other in other sectors using the DAP. So you should look at their website just while you're working with them. Anyway, so um, <laughs> um, we did disseminate locally, and there was a lot of interest in this, and people were wanting to do, want to do those studies and all kinds of stuff that they didn't have money for, but there was a lot of interest. And um, and so we were, we were there was some engagement with the schools. Um, it, it hasn't, the, the person from IRH who um, was um, the M&E officer at the time that was the, the primary person in the field working on this doesn't work with IRH any longer. So it kind of lost a little momentum in terms of what's happening locally and what people locally were interested in doing. Um, but, but I think it certainly has potential and, um, uh, you know, we would clearly be interested in, in helping anyone who wants to use it or take that forward. Um, the questions that you were raising about um, uh, the empowerment question or feeling like they could tell a boy to stop doing something that made them feel uncomfortable among the girls. Um, um, I think that would be really interesting to see when, you know, longitudinally what happens when they get a little bit older. Um, I forget what the other questions were. I'm just writing things down, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> how do people find out? Because we're going to have to wrap up. But how do people yeah. find out more about, for example, how to do this kind of, and I think if people was going to say something, too, about about creating and implementing surveys that are child or adolescent friendly. Um, no? Okay. <laughs> but how do people find out? <laughs> how do people, I know that there's a lot of information in the article and in the brief and as well as in uh -huh. the report. Mm -hmm. um, and we have additional stuff that we just didn't put in either of those documents. Um, so, I mean, anyone who has a question or wants to talk more can contact me. I'm quite happy to talk about this um, and, our, and the methods that we used in the, in the data collection. Um, uh, and, and, and equally so, I think I can volunteer my colleagues, Peter Scales and um, Mara Shramko is not at Search Institute anymore, she's now a graduate student, but um, I, I'm very sure that Peter would be incredibly responsive to any questions that you might have. Um, I don't know if his email information is on our website somewhere, but I can also provide that if anybody would like to talk. Actually, his email that. is on the on the journal article. It's on, it's, yeah. So he's one of the so authors. So he's one of the authors, and, and, and he's, he, he is the sort of, you know, one of the developers of the DAP, so he could really answer more kind of detailed questions about how it was developed and where these measures came from and those kinds of things. And how it performs in the U.S., he has been leading off this. Great. And if I could add, Kim, we're, we will be sending a follow-up email with the slides and, and the links that were provided in the presentation and contact information so that folks can follow up if they think of yeah. questions. Great, thanks. Yeah. And I think that the experience with collecting data among very young adolescents and other adolescents from the GREAT project is yeah. also informative. So there's a lot of information on that, that website. Mm -hmm. And if you have other questions, to please send an email. And thank you so much for those of you who have joined in person. Thank you. And for those who have joined by Zoom and by phone, we thank you. And so have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming.
much more we can do with this. I know. Really good questions. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm gonna look at that. I was taking notes over there about everything I wanted.